Well, hello, everybody. Um, apologies um, from my end uh, for the technical difficulties that uh, we were having here on the Saranac Lake campus uh, during the uh, just just as we uh, were supposed to begin uh, our live uh, meeting. So uh, I will do a shortened version of uh, what I had intended. I'm going to turn my notifications off on my phone. Otherwise, you're going to hear a beep over and over again. Um, so I'll give a, a sort of truncated version of uh, what had what I had planned to be a, a discussion of the two essays that uh, the one that you read for last week, uh, Eula Biss's, um The Pain Scale, and uh, this week, uh, just as an introductory uh, for the John Berger um, essay, uh, Ways of Seeing. Uh, both, uh, as I said last week, both are sort of non-standard um, essays. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're uh, a reader of essays, which not many people are, quite frankly. It's not the not the biggest uh, seller in the in the book world, but um, essays have been around since you know, the Greek and Roman days, uh, and um, certainly uh, throughout human history. Uh, and they've tended to be uh, mostly scholarly and mostly uh, either persuasive or uh, descriptive or you know fell into a general mode or, or, or tradition of, uh, you know, like a, a philosophical discussion, um, that kind of a thing. And starting really oh, mid-19th century uh, with, with writers like Henry David Thoreau, uh, an American writer, and uh, Montaigne, who was a, a French writer of essays, and um, numerous others, especially in the in the in our realm of, of English literature, um, people like Samuel Johnson and um, that time period. Uh, that's really the 18th century uh, that we're talking about here. Samuel Bo uh, yeah, Samuel Boswell, um, a number of others. There grew this newish kind of writing that was less traditional, less along the lines of, um, you know, trying to make a philosophical argument or, or persuade people or simply describe something. And to add to that tradition of nonfiction, um, objective writing, a uh, more subjectivity, more personal opinion, more personal experience, and then ultimately elements of what um, the, the sort of writing style that you find and techniques that you find in fiction writing as well. And it goes by various names. Um, the most recent uh, is not a creative nonfiction, um, which allows it to be more than uh, simply uh, objective, straightforward description, persuasion, etc., uh, and allows these elements of autobiography and, and allows uh, experimentalism with language and with style and with uh, paragraphing and so on. So in looking at how they appear on the page, both Eulabus and um, John Berger sort of specialize in these um, very short sentences, very short paragraphs, that despite their shortness and uh, brevity uh, are in some ways more complicated uh, than, you know, long sustained sentences and long sustained paragraphs of somebody writing a century ago or so, or even earlier in the 20th century, somebody um, like George Orwell, for example, or Virginia uh, Woolf, um, both, uh, enormously wonderful writers of, of in the essay form as you know in other forms as well fiction for both of them uh, as well um, but their Orwell especially uh, strove in his writing to be direct and clear and you know leave not that he didn't use elements of creativity uh, metaphor things like that in his essay writing um, but he, uh, 
it, he strove to be as crystal clear as possible and not leave the sort of ambiguity of language and form that we find in both um, Eulabis and in um, uh, John Berger, uh, both writing about completely different things. Um, you know, obviously Biss in this um, essay, not in all of her essays, obviously, but in this essay, uh, she's focusing on um, the experience of pain and how it was such a, a personal and subjective thing can possibly be measured. Uh, and again, I mentioned this last week, we discussed the, the pain scale that we find in a dentist office or a doctor's office, emergency room, uh, anywhere really where you find uh, healthcare uh, going on, you will find that pain scale that, you know, from the smiley face at, at zero or one to the uh, slightly more strained looking face by the time you're at four or five to the uh, ultimate, you know, screaming face or crying face at, at nine or 10 and those various levels of, of pain. And, and of course, this is not talking just about physical pain here. She's talking about disability. She's talking about um, uh, emotional pain. And of course, the, the connection between uh, physical pain and emotional pain that, that one can cause the other uh, either way around. Uh, if you, and I'm sure many of you have had the experience of um, tremendous grief causing what feels like, I mean, we call it heartache, right? We call it broken heart uh, when we have that. And it, it, um, it sometimes feels that way, that that emotional agony of loss of a loved one, of the wrecking of a relationship, uh, betrayal by a friend or, or a loved one or a sibling or whoever it happens to be, um, that that is so intense and so shocking and so sudden, uh, perhaps, um, that it registers in our bodies, um, you know, intense anger or intense emotion for some people can cause migraine headaches. Uh, or other phantom pains throughout the body. Um, she goes into, she, Eulabis, goes into also how pain is a uh, protector of us, uh, that, you know, it's there for a reason. Um, you know, if you take a Darwinian approach to understanding uh, our biology, we evolved to experience pain uh, because those who don't experience pain or who have dulled emotions are at greater risk of injury than people who don't experience, uh, that do experience pain. Uh, so that, you know, it's our body's way of warning us to not do that again. Um, I remember when I was about five years old or so, um, my older brother, who was a couple years older than me, um, reached up and placed his hand on, on what he thought was a, a cold burner on the stove. I don't know what he was thinking. You know, our mom was very careful about us, you know, when we were young in the kitchen, um, obviously not wanting us to injure ourselves, but he had that, you know, that, that thing that we do sometimes as human beings, we just have to pull on a thread to see what happens. Um, I think he just sort of did this as a, as a crazy experiment or something in it. It was a dark, it was an electric stove, but often the elements on an electric stove are still hot, even though they um, are no longer, um, you know, glowing red. Uh, they're, they're dark again because they've cooled down to that point, but they're still hot enough to burn uh, the skin. And he got, you know, second degree burn on his hand, um, you know, in the shape of the, of the rings of the burner. And, uh, you know, that's, so common that it, uh, an experience that um, it's become sort of a metaphor, you know, touching the hot stove uh, is a metaphor for, you know, truth or dare or something like that. Um, but it's also a teaching moment. You're never going to do that again if you can help it. Um, and, you know, he, um, there, are, if you've injured yourself, obviously, I've, like when the numerous times I've sprained ankles and knees, um, it's our body's way of saying to us, Hey, don't, don't step on this or don't put your weight on this 
until it heals. And, you know, that pain is there to remind us that we have damaged ourselves. There's something uh, amiss in our, um, in that, in that joint, that limb. And, you know, give it, give it some time to heal before you go out, you know, and run another mile. Um, in the rare instance of people who do not experience pain, and there are people who, you know, have either very little response to pain or um, who literally don't, for whatever biochemical reason, uh, don't experience pain either much or at all, um, we might think, oh, how fortunate they are. But a person like that could walk on a broken leg uh, unless it was a compound fracture where the bone was literally coming through the skin and, and was interfering with the mechanics of walking, you know, that person could continue walking on a broken um, limb and, and continuously re-injure it. Or that person could, um, you know, burn themselves and not realize it and, and you know, get an infection in the burned area uh, very easily. Um, you know, it might, it might be nice if you're, a, a, you know, playing football, not to feel the pain of, of contact, but that pain again is a way of protecting you from uh, further injury. Uh, and emotional pain as well, uh, as awful as it is, is often um, a warning. Uh, it's, you know, we've all, I would be willing to guess, every one of you, including me, has been through the pain of you know, a, a loss of a loved one. Well, there's nothing you can necessarily do about that. You can't, in, in all likelihood, say, swear off, well, I'm never going to care about anybody ever again uh, because that was so painful to lose that loved one. You know, we all have friends, we all have families, we all have, um, you know, people that we care about. Uh, and so it's, that emotional pain isn't, you know, particularly useful for us other than it's an opportunity to grieve for that person and to honor that person's uh, life. Uh, but the sort of pain that may be a warning, emotional pain, that may be a warning uh, sort of thing for um, for us is like if you are in a relationship with a friend or even a family member or a, a boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, soulmate, and there's betrayal, there's, um, you know, a messy, awful breakup, uh, or there's emotional abuse, or whatever it might be, um, it might warn us away from getting into a relationship again with a person like that, if that person uh, is, you know, likely to do that again, or that sort of person, or, you know, you'll fall victim to, um, the machinations and cruelties of uh, someone who would um, would so take advantage of you or so betray you, and it might make us more cautious. And of course, I'm no psychiatrist um, or psychologist, so you know. I, but I am aware that that people do fall into patterns, and um, you know, we we tend to repeat behaviors that even though we've been burned emotionally before we end up going right back to somebody like that again. Um, often victims of abuse um, in one relationship will move on to another relationship and with a very similar person or a very similar personality and, and be further abused. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's when somebody often needs, you know, some, some help from loved ones from counseling or, um, you know, some other, somebody needs to intervene on the part of that person, uh, lest they continue down that uh, path of, of abuse. Um, so business um, discussion and her, her moving up the pain scale, up, up the scale, uh, looking at other things like the Beaufort scale for, uh, for wind and, and other types of scales is a, the, the entire document is a, is, a, is a gigantic question mark about how do we truly understand the pain of others um, and moving, you know, not even going down the, the philosophical path of 
you know, how do we even know that, that other people experience pain or anything like we experience? I think we can dispense with that sort of uh, noodling, um, uh, at least for our purposes. And just to understand the, the idea of um, empathy and sympathy for other people who are experiencing either, either or, um, either emotional and or um, uh, physical pain, and how, again, those things intertwine with each other, um, and understanding the suffering of others. Uh, there have been quite a bit of writing on this topic by uh, people like Virginia Woolf, who wrote a, a wonderful argument, uh, uh, um, essay, longish essays, you know, several dozen pages, uh, called On Illness. And she was someone who suffered both from physical illness and also uh, emotional illness and, and uh, unfortunately ended her own life, um, you know, after years and years and years of emotional uh, pain that she just couldn't uh, move away from. Um, uh, the, the essayist Susan Sontag wrote a, um, uh, a fascinating essay, again, a longish essay, several chapters, called um, uh, On the Suffering of Others. And it's a it's a, an investigation of well, it begins with some uh, drawings uh, by um, Spanish artist and I can't think of his name or not, Goya um, who uh, witnessed a war and drew sketches and drawings and made paintings of um, people being tortured, people who had died in horrible ways, and people who were being executed, uh, a rather ghoulish um, series of images. But he was trying to document, way prior to uh, photography, he was trying to document, um, you know, the suffering of others and how warfare causes uh, innumerable suffering amongst, you know, tens or thousands of, of, of people. Um, and, you know, people, um, have documented war for forever, uh, and Sontag is curious about that. She's, she's questioning why it is we have a fascination with, uh, gory pictures, um, horror films, uh, things where other people are suffering and we are not. We are in the comfort of our easy chair reading about or looking at images of, other people suffering. Uh, when I was teaching, early on when I was teaching high school and middle school, uh, this was in the early days of uh, VCRs and, and uh, pre-DVDs, um, uh, so VHS tapes were still relatively a new thing. Um, I was very concerned that some of my students, and these were eighth and ninth graders quite often, were absolutely fascinated by and passing from one hand to the other, you know, around the circle, um, a series of video tapes called Faces of Death, which were or were, pur were purported to be um, images of people dying in horrible ways. And, you know, these young teenagers were fascinated by these things. And you know, I was concerned, obviously, that their parents weren't aware of what they were watching and sharing with each other, much in the same way that now, uh, you know, people are concerned about what's on the internet and what's, what you can find on YouTube and, you know, the pornography that is readily available, obviously, online um, and things like that. And, and Faces of Death is probably still out there, that, that series. But, you know, what is the fascination we have? And, and you know, with this, with this ghoulish... Um, stuff. Um, so yeah, she covers a lot of ground in this, um, in this essay on pain. And, and, um, next week when we're back together live, I'll, I'll, uh, carve out a little time for us to discuss, um, any lingering issues, questions you might have, thoughts you may have had, um, with pain. Oh, and I mentioned last week, I don't know if this is going to be reversed or if, if it's going to get flipped over when, when it goes live on YouTube. But this is the book from which both of the um, essays came, Ways of Reading, as I mentioned last week. Uh, it is um, 
it, it is the anthology that we all used to use uh, in uh, English 102, and then we moved away from that. But these were two essays uh, from it that I continue to use um, because they're readily available. Uh, flipping over very quickly to Berger, and we'll definitely uh, spend some time next week talking about Berger. Um, you know, I was just going to essentially introduce him uh, to you this, this week, today. Um, his is completely different, very similar style in some ways to uh, this, but uh, obviously very different subject matter. And his concerns are the world of art, um, our art history, um, and this is the visual arts, obviously, um, and uh, as well uh, his uh, the connection between art and politics and wealth. Um, and how those things are intermingled, but also how art, looking at art on the one hand is different, a different way of seeing than the seeing that we do when we look out a window and watch a bird fly by, or when we watch our dog romping in the snow, or when we look at our children, or when we watch TV. Um, art has a place in, in human culture that is visual art, that is unlike um, almost anything else, even literature, even music. Um, and it's developed a sort of mystique. Um, and this is not with, with the emergence of modern art, which was say roughly 1890-ish, um, through the beginning of, this, of, the, of World War II. That is the modern period. So when you hear people talking about art that's being made today, 2022, uh, or made 10 years ago, and they call it modern art, they're getting it wrong. Uh, modern art is a very specific thing. It begins at a very specific time historically, uh, the 1890s, and really flowering in the early, uh, the first decade of the 20th century, um, with the emergence of Georges Braque and, um, um, I can't, names are escaping me today. Uh, Pablo Picasso, in particular, in the visual arts, were, were two of the prime movers in, in Cubism, which was really one of the first modern arts that people recognized as, as you know, being something, wow, that's completely different. Um, art is always abstract. Art is always an abstraction. So to say some, you know, that ab abstract art I don't like, um, all art is abstract. <laughs> so um, it, it is an interpretation of the world or an idea or of whatever it's about or, or color or whatever. And we're going to talk, uh, people have a, uh, many people have a, an automatic, like, I don't want to see any more of that. Thank you very much. Uh, about uh, art from that time period, the modern art era, um, because it requires some understanding. It requires some knowledge. It requires some effort on the behalf of the viewer to understand it. And often people say, well, it looks like, you know, my brother, my five-year-old brother could have done that with a box of Crayola crayons. And, you know, quite frankly, no, um, not, not the concepts, not the idea behind it. And we'll talk about um, some of those ideas. Again, I'm not an art historian. I'm not an artist in, in uh, the visual arts. Um, but I've come to understand a lot of it, uh, through a being married to, to an artist, <laughs> my wife is a painter and, uh, you know, really watching a lot of things like the John Berger, uh, ways of seeing, uh, where he explains a lot of, a lot of these, um, ideas. We'll talk, um, at some length about that image, um, uh, that he begins the essay with, uh, the, I'll hold it up here for you, if I can find it very quickly. There it is. The painting, The Key of Dreams by Rene Magritte. Um, we'll begin, there's the camera. We'll begin with that uh, next week when we, when we discuss um, the, the painting um, and um, 
go from there. Um, so the, the interlinking between um, privilege and wealth and the visual arts um, is stronger because of the cost of materials and because of the, the need for the artist to eat uh, and pay for a house <laughs> um, has always been there. And this idea that art has required patrons. Uh, if you're a writer, um, all you require is a place to write, the materials to write with, it's very inexpensive, um, maybe a little bit of money to do your research and to live on while you're producing the thing. But as long as you have a reading public, um, you're good, as long as your writing is good enough to sell. Um, if you're a musician, you know, somebody who creates music, you need an audience, obviously, and a paying one, hopefully, to, you know, give you enough money to, to buy tomorrow's uh, food and pay for your housing. Um, if you're a writer of music, same thing. You need an audience that likes what you're writing and, and is willing to pay to listen to it. Um, if you're a production potter, all you need is somebody to, you know, a place to show your uh, pottery and, um, you know, again, a, an audience that, that likes it enough to pay whatever you charge for, for the work that you do. Uh, if you're lucky, uh, you might, you know, be picked up by a major manufacturer. A um, friend of ours is, is, um, uh, has a contract with um, one of the major department stores, uh, Neiman Marcus, I believe it is. Uh, and, you know, they saw her work that she was doing independently uh, and she was selling in, you know, various places. And they say, they said, hey, if you, you know, produce a thousand of these things, we'll sell them in our stores. And, you know, this, so, I mean, that's guaranteed income uh, for her. Um, it's just a huge amount of work for her. She's throwing pots day and night and she's actually going to have to hire a couple of uh, potters. She does the designs. She does the glazing and, and a lot of the throwing, but you know, in a production pottery situation, you know, your your name is on it because you designed it. Your name is on it because it's ultimately your business, but it might be produced by people other than yourself. Um, you know, you'll have a hand in it, obviously, but but you might not throw every vessel. Um, so that runs into a question of authenticity and, and some of the other issues that Berger touches on in, in this essay. Um, if you are an architect, um, you know, you need to be able to create a building that is going to stand up, hold together for, you know, a hundred years, a thousand years, whatever. You need somebody who's going to uh, buy your plans and then you're done. You're not the engineer. You're just the architect. You, you've drawn the plans. You may show up on the work site and, and oversee part of it. Um, but, you know, your part is to create the idea. You're, and, and then engineers and contractors do the rest uh, for you. But if you're a painter, um, again, you need a, an audience that's willing to pay enough money for your work uh, that you um, can, you know, keep bread on the table and a, and a roof over your head. And that is not easy, um, especially since uh, painting materials and supplies are very expensive. I just tallied up, you know, our expenses for my wife for uh, 2021. She's painting three or four days a week, um, you know, large paintings, and she takes her four or five months to finish one. Um, the smaller paintings take two or three months. Um, she works one at a time. So, you know, she just finished a painting that took her, she started in October and she just finished it two days ago. Um, for her to keep painting, buying hardwood that she paints on, the paints that she uses, the gesso, all the other stuff, um, it was over $7,000 last year. Um, that's a bunch of money. Um, and, you know, it's it's what she does. It's it, it, She made more than she spent, so that's good. Um, but it's not enough to live on. Uh, it's, a, it's a supplemental for us. And, um, you know, she's sold a few big paintings, uh, in the last several years. 
so it's, it's been very successful and um, her name is getting up there but nonetheless it's it's she wouldn't be able to you know make a living doing this it's just you know despite the quality of her work it's it's just not um, you know very hard for people to do that once you know Jackson Pollock or your uh, somebody like that, you know, you can labor in obscurity for a number of years and then all of a sudden you have a opportunity for a big show in New York and you, you know, you start selling big paintings for thousands and thousands of dollars, then, you know, you've kind of made it, but it's hard to get to that level. Very hard. Very few artists ever do. Um, and so it's always been a, a question, there's always been these questions of money around the visual arts. Um, you know, not that there haven't been for struggling art um, musicians and struggling writers and struggling architects and struggling potters, um, and all the other arts, struggling dancers, um, struggling actors. Uh, it's kind of a, a cliche, uh, the starving artist, but uh, I think it's more so connected with the visual arts than almost any other form of, of the what we call the arts um, that's it um, next week uh, we'll resume and, and uh, again have a brief conversation about uh, just kind of sweeping the floor uh, of Eulabus's art, uh, uh, essay uh, if you have anything you want to add or ask about it I'll, I'll you know, we'll spend maybe 15 minutes on that if, if, if it just tra trails off and, and goes nowhere uh, then we'll just jump right into John Berger. And then the following week, um, I'll introduce that as well. And the following week is the first of the podcasts that I'm going to have you look at, the um, 21st century um, mythologies. And so with that, um, I thank you for watching and listening. And uh, again, apologies for the snafu uh, of our uh, internet issues here on Saranac Lake campus. I thought, you know, I sometimes have that at home <laughs> because, you know, we live out in the middle of the country um, and sometimes we have um, internet issues. So I thought, well, I'll come to campus today and it's sure to be a good thing. And well, wouldn't you know, it's sure to be not necessarily a good thing. So anyway, take care and I will see you next week.